Welcome to the Startup of the Year podcast, where each episode we showcase exciting new companies from around the world. This podcast is produced by Established, creators of the Startup of the Year program. Established is focused on helping organizations with their innovation, startup, and communication strategies. Everybody, and welcome back to the Startup of Your Podcast. I'm Frank Gruber, the co-founder and co-CEO of Established, also the co-founder of Established Ventures and the team behind the Startup of Your community and this very podcast. And we are on episode number 50. That's right, 5-0. It's been a great journey, and thanks, everyone, for listening. On this episode, I'm talking with Meredith Feynman, who is an entrepreneur, author, best-selling, best-selling author, writer, speaker, podcast host, and women's advocate. She's the uh, founder and CEO of uh, FinePoint, a leadership and professional development company with a focus on uh, visibility and voice. And she's the author of Brag Better. It's about mastering the art of fearless self-promotion. It's an Amazon bestseller and has been mentioned in outlets like the New York Times, Fast Company, and many, many more. Uh, you can purchase a book actually on Amazon right now. I will include the link in the show notes. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to share some thoughts and words of advice from Rich Malloy, our VP of Engagement at Established, also part of the Established Venture team. Uh, he's got some tips uh, for startup founders with a segment we call the VC Minute. Hi, this is Rich Malloy with Established Ventures bringing you the VC Minute. Quick advice to help startup founders fundraise better. Let's talk about the shits. Nothing like potty humor to get your attention. In all seriousness, SHITS is an acronym I heard along the way that perfectly describes the VC slow roll. It stands for Show High Interest Then Stall. And this is a legitimate venture capital strategy, even if unintended. Now, it's less effective in coastal, fast-close environments, but it still happens with great frequency throughout the country. The rationale behind this from the VC perspective is that before I write a check, time is my ally. And as soon as I write a check, time is my enemy. The longer I'm on the sidelines, the more information I get, the more I learn about you, your company, your competitors, traction, and team. And I may be genuinely interested, but if there is no immediate need to commit to a round, I'm going to sit on the sidelines and wait and watch. When an investor has conviction, they will give you a firm no, a firm yes, or even a conditional yes, such as, as long as we can hit our ownership percentage, we're in whenever you get a lead. Unfortunately, the most likely scenario, and one you may be accustomed to getting, is the shits. And it's not the mark of a bad investor, just one that lacks conviction about your opportunity. You can't force conviction, but you can drive action. You can drive action to a decision in a few ways. First, you can ask direct questions about what it takes to get to a yes. Next, you can show additional interest in the round, and I've talked about this in previous episodes. When a round is coming together, I need to know if I'm going to get off the sidelines and get in the game or if I'm going to pass altogether. And finally, you can drive action through deadlines. There's nothing like a deadline to get people to take action on anything. When you have enough interest, including from VCs giving you the shits, set a deadline and start pulling the round together. That's all for the VC Minute. Back to you, Frank. Thanks so much, Rich. Great tips on better understanding investors who may be sitting on things a little bit longer than you expected. All right, switching gears for a moment, I want to talk about our South by Southwest Serendipity and Innovation events, which we just finished up uh, this week. Uh, We had two interesting programming segments. One was really focused on government uh, funding opportunities for startups, which featured some of of our partners from NASA, SBA, NSF, NIH, and DOE. It was a great segment, and it was uh, really a lot of great feedback. We had 1,000-something people or so register, and a great number of people attend and get their questions answered. Our second, second segment was a venture capital uh, verse pitch, where we had seven investors pitch uh, why their funds should be taken by startups, which is really interesting. And we really turned the tables and had some great interactions with startups who got a chance to break out and talk with some of the investors as well. Both sessions were fantastic and posted uh, on our established uh, YouTube. So if you go to SOTY.link forward slash EST YouTube, again, it's SOTY.link forward slash EST YouTube. You can go check it out uh, and watch those video recaps. Maybe, you know, glean a few more things from watching it if you've already attended or learn new things if you haven't. So hope you enjoy them and find them helpful. 
We also utilize the new app Clubhouse, which unfortunately is only on iOS right now. Soon, have, hopefully, it'll be on Android as well. So sorry if you didn't make it. But we did have uh, so, some great conversations over there as well, where audience members could interact with some of the speakers in an additional Q&A session. So it was a lot of fun. We had some amazing uh, questions asked and answered by some of our, our thought leaders. So thanks for, so much for everyone that joined. Uh, we're going to do more Clubhouse Rooms uh, hosting in the Startup Community Club, which is our club. Uh, you can go and search for Startup Community Club on the app and learn more about it and join it. As well as uh, if you go to EST forward slash Clubhouse, you can go to it directly just via the web. Or if you want to follow me, just follow me at, at Frank Gruber. I'll be doing a number of different uh, talks and Q&As and other sessions as well. So hope to join. Uh, you can join one of those sessions and we can connect over there on Clubhouse as well. It's a lot of fun. All right. It's also that time of the year where we're actually, we've got our Startup of the Year application open, which is pretty awesome. Uh, we're looking for some amazing startups from all around the country to, that's, that are looking for exposure, connections, community, and to be a part of our um, ongoing um, annual uh, progression here as we, we march towards our, our summit, which will come up in the fall here. So if you're interested in being a part of it, go to SOTY.link forward slash apply 21. Again, SOTY.link apply 21 and get your application in right away. And it's not just about being a part of winning potentially the start of the year. There's a lot more to, the, more to that with our community. We do a number of office hours. We've got an ongoing thread with our, our entrepreneurs as we continue to try to help and add value throughout their journey. So please check that out. And if you're not a startup, you can also get involved. Just go to our, our uh, go to that link and, or maybe find our contact link and connect with us. We'd love to include additional mentors and judges and uh, for some of our summit related things. And there's just a lot of a lot of activities we host throughout the year. And if you're interested in getting involved, please reach out. All right. Uh, I wanted to continue um, to share a little bit more about another program we're working on. For those that are interested, we actually work with other organizations like NASA and the NASA iTech program, which is looking for startups for their various pitch opportunities. Uh, if you're interested in connecting and, and learning more about that, go to est.us forward slash NIT. Uh, est.us forward slash NIT and learn more about the opportunities of working with uh, potentially even getting in front of and pitching NASA's chief sec, uh, check, chief sec, uh, scientists and technologists uh, at one of these opportunities. So a lot of great stuff coming with them and we work, we love working with NASA. Big fans of, of space and everything that they're up to. So check it out, est.us uh, forward slash NIT, est.us forward slash NIT and learn more about the NASA iTech program and the opportunities. All right, finally, if you want to learn more about other opportunities, we're always trying to help uh, startup founders with some of the uh, different startup opportunities out there in the world. Go to established.us forward slash programs, established.us forward slash programs. It's the best way to get notified of the various startup opportunities that we come across while working with our various uh, partner organizations and a number of ecosystems across the country. So lots of opportunities coming down the pipe here. i uh, love to have you involved. So go to est.us forward slash programs. Okay, that was a lot, and uh, I'd love to get to our conversation now with Meredith Feynman uh, from our 2020, sorry, 2020 Start of the Year Summit, which we just uh, hosted last fall. Uh, we got, I got a chance to sit down with her, and uh, here's that interview. Welcome, Meredith. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi. I, I'm sorry, but you don't brag better on the shelf behind you, but otherwise, I'm excited to be here. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. So I wanted to have it in my hand. <laughs> I only have one copy. This is my precious copy. So okay. Okay. You got one too. I, I like to keep it handy, right? Right here. So I can I reference can, it. I can walk around with this. <laughs> I just carry yeah. it everywhere. I have a little satchel. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. So before we get started into, let's just dive right in, actually. Um, what, you know, so bragging in general, like it's probably, as we grow up, bragging has kind of had this negative connotation people probably told you when you're younger don't brag it's little blah, blah blah you know like can you tell us why um why you know we should start to start bragging and maybe brag better yeah so it's not a pretty word uh the right. problem is it's kind of the only one we have to describe the activities that i'm talking about which is i define bragging as stating true facts about your work strategically and cohesively to advance your career it's necessary to tell people what you do, especially in a time when we're all behind screens. I know of a lot of the people watching this, you know, are in startups, you got to pitch yourself, your work. It's an essential part of work. And, you know, I thought I've been, you know, speaking and training on bragging for the better part of a decade. And I thought of many people have told me not to use the word and it has a negative connotation. The problem is we just don't have a vocabulary to talk about professional accomplishment in a positive light and that's right. too long for a title so right no, that, that is a long title I mean I I agree with that I've always believed that and lived by the idea that no one's going to tell your story for you 
So obviously I loved when you published this book recently and, you know, it's an opportunity for people to learn how to better tell their story. So let's, um, since we are at, you know, the start of the year summit, I feel like we should kick things off with a little bit of a um, startup-ish kind of angle. Um, what can startups learn from some, some of the folks that have been out there maybe bragging and maybe not doing it so well? So like Theranos and maybe more recently um, <laughs> NS8. NS8. I mean, you know, th th yeah. there's a backfire potentially of, of bragging too well and yeah, so that's very, that's very extreme. So yeah. I'll back up for a second and say that the core messages of my book is that your accomplishments are worth talking about. If you, I run my own business, it's hard. It's hard to always be touting yourself and your work. Uh, it's necessary for spreading a message. My background for this book and for my training and speaking is in public relations and this idea of packaging and pitching yourself, which is so necessary for startups for visibility, for money, for, mm -hmm. you know, getting the right board members, it totally runs the gamut. Um, but it's, it's a hard, vulnerable thing to do. And, right. you know, we're looking at these extreme examples, uh, you know, it's funny, because people ask me, I define bragging as stating true facts about your work strategically and cohesively to advance your career, whether that's for an internship, or a corporate board seat. Um, and, you know, people hinge on the true facts part. Uh, we're in a really interesting time when it comes to sort of truth and meaning. And, and my audience is called the qualified quiet. People that mm -hmm. have done the work, but don't know how to talk about it. To some right. degree, that's all of us. You have to make noise to have a successful startup at any level. Um, and, and so it's, it's a necessary skill set that you can learn. It's nobody's born with it. Yeah, I talk about like, you know, uh, Theranos and other like crime, that's, that's a very, very extreme example, but it does underscore that we are rewarding the wrong voices. And we have this really intense inverse relationship between volume and merit and we reward loud. And as much as I would like to be optimistic and say that we can get the loud people to be quiet, it's a matter of getting that qualified quiet to turn up the volume. And we all know someone in our industry, uh, in our networks, in our classrooms, depending on where you are, who has done less than we have and gets more recognition. Um, and I care that we really have those qualified, thoughtful voices speaking up. Um, mm -hmm. And this is how to go about doing it. Right. So your your advice then would be don't get angry about the fact that these folks are loud. Get louder. Right. And, and, and do it yourself. Yes. Yeah, so the so when I so the pillars of bragging better are to be proud, loud and strategic. Proud, you know, is to be proud of your work, which I think is the hardest one. Loud does not mean the volume of your voice. Mm -hmm. I have been in and around media and public relations for over 10 years. What breaks through is repetition and consistency. So when I say loud, I mean the repetition of your message, your startup, your needs, your wants, your wins, mm -hmm. um, and consistency of message all over online and then in person, you know, when that can happen again. Uh, right. This is especially difficult right now when we're behind screens. And if you're someone who is like, I just got to get into the room and pitch them or, or 10 minutes with you, mm -hmm. um, that can that can make it really, really super difficult. Um, so, so that's important to keep in mind. And it's easy. We all get jealous or angry or whatever at someone who's like, well, I've done so much more than they have. Why are they on the panel? Why are they getting X and Y and Z? Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully not dwelling on that and figuring out a way to be loud in a way that feels okay to you um, is what matters. It's about what's true to you as well. Okay. So let's talk about, you know, maybe you're, you're part of that group that's not out there being loud enough and not doing enough repetition. How do you come up with a strategy for bragging better? So the first thing um, is if a conference booker or a journalist, if you're really looking for outward recognition, can't figure out who you are, what you're about and what you want or need. Um, again, it's, it's all circling around the idea of a good pitch, uh, whether that pitch is for media, whether that pitch is for money, whether that pitch is to hire, you know, it, it, you use that in every facet of your life, which is where the skill set comes from is PR, this, this idea of packaging and telling a good story and getting what you want out of it. Um, and so a place to start, a really great place to start. I tell everyone to ask five people with different vantage points to describe what you do. Maybe in this case, you ask five people with different vantage points what they think your startup does. Um, and that can be a family member who loves you, but might not totally understand your work and a friend who cares about you, but like, you know, they don't want to talk about work all the time. And then a work acquaintance, someone you only know through social media, and then just pick a fifth vantage point. 
that's a really great place to figure out, okay, what's the current perception? What do people currently think I do? And if I take the average of those five points of view, is that how I'm currently wanting to describe myself and my work? Uh, that's a great place to start as is things like consistent bios, consistent headshots, make it really easy for someone to get the full download on you, especially because we're in an emergency situation mm -hmm. and you just need to hand, hand people who you are and what you want on a silver platter. Right. So you mentioned a couple tactics there that I think are really powerful, um, starting with the consistency. So consistency around your bio, like does that, that means on every social platform, try to get consistency. Yes. Yeah, so I obsessively talk about bios. Um, yeah. I think that bios are just some people, they're hard to do. It's hard to write about yourself. You can get someone to help you. You can get, you know, my, my firm does it. Other people write mm -hmm. professional bios. But the point is, it's an original bragging spot, which means that a lot of people's judgments around bragging, when you, when you do talk positively about your work, particularly if you're a woman or particularly if you're just, sorry, Frank, not a white guy, it, it, it is met with certain feelings, but right. People expect you to brag in a bio. That's where you put the kitchen sink, all your awards, all the accolades. That's where it goes. People expect to see that. So they're already primed to look at for your accomplishments. So you need a long, a short, and a two-line bio. Update them maybe once a quarter. Put in the calendar reminder. Keep a running Google Doc or whatever you use of your wins so you don't have to think back. Um, and yes, those long, short, and two-line, because here's the thing. Um, you know, if you give someone your long bio, you never want anyone to infer who you are. You have to hand it to them. So yes, it needs to be consistent across platform so that but it is- People are lazy, question. right? I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. right? People are lazy inherently. Yes. They're yeah. not gonna dig down and find what you've been doing, like follow the links. They're, and they're lazy, but also you never want, and you talked about the importance of telling your own story. Right. You never want someone to infer anything about who you are. Like for example, if you don't have an up-to-date bio and I have 30 seconds to look at you, I might think you do something totally different from what you actually are currently doing. Right. And then you lost an opportunity. Right. Is that fast? Yep, definitely. That's really interesting. So baseline, get that, get that bio going. Maybe even you, you've got some other suggestions with um, like a website, personal website. Yes. Personal website. Um, again, you just want to, I like it because it's a one-stop shop of you. A lot of people are really stopped up because of the sort of technical aspects, which it's never been easier mm -hmm. to use, you know, varying website platforms. Um, but you need to have, especially since we are in an economy where we all do so many different things. Right. I write, I speak, I podcast, I, you know, have my business. And sometimes it, you need to lay it out for people again, you need to make it very easy for them. And it's also just a great place for you to look at everything you've done. Um, but there are opportunities all around you to create this cohesive narrative about who you are. Something as small as your email signature to mm. talk about all the time should have links to correct things. And especially in the startup world, no matter what you're pitching for at whatever level um, and, and whatever point in your career, um, you just want to show people who you are really quickly and, and get to a yes. Right. And I think there's something there with words too. Words really matter. Um, the way that you, so like, for example, if you're out there trying to raise funding, um, the way that you put the context you use of how you're doing it, whether you're out, I'm raising funding or I've raised funding, like the way that you actually say it matters, right? Yeah. Your word choice definitely matters. I, so this idea of packaging and pitching yourself, as I said, mm -hmm is is irrespective of level of seniority mm -hmm. um and it, everyone has different sort of touch points that they want out of their brags but mm -hmm. particularly for fundraising i mean these think about sitting on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and just how many times these people are asked for money mm -hmm. for varying concepts that people are willing to you know die on a hill for and right. and so um picking your words carefully, practicing, um, but also understanding that, you know, I did 20 amazing interviews, with really interesting people for this book. One of them is Natalia Obertino Guerra, who runs Pipeline Angels. Right. Um, and, and she talks about how also pitching is not a zero sum game. So for me, the word choice is important, but the sentiment behind it, the confidence behind it, the strategery, if you will, behind it, um, mm -hmm. is actually what's most important is sort of that third pillar of bragging better strategic. It's like, well, what am I packaging this for? Am mm -hmm. I making sure this is the right audience? This is what they want to hear. Um, and is this going to lead to, in this case, funding. Right. And there are some superpower words too, right? Do you want to share how you use those? Yeah. So I have, 
those are more about tone. So as a writer, I wanted to create a tactical, you know, skill-based book uh, on, on how to talk positively about yourself and professional accomplishment. And that tone varies depending on who you are. So superpower words are, so mine are usually thoughtful, helpful, and, and funny. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what I care about communicating. And I think all of the things that I do and say and post and tweet, do those reinforce the words that make me feel confident and powerful, but they're also a way to help figure out the tone of the way you communicate things and what you want to communicate um, and, and how you want people to think of you. That makes sense. All right. So I'm a big fan of gratitude and I know that can be a big part of, of bragging better as well. How do you, how do you use gratitude to uh, brag better? Yeah. So I didn't include the word humble brag in the book and mm -hmm. people ask about it and have since it came out in June kind of nonstop um, because I do not believe that being humble and bragging are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using brag because it's basically the only word we have to describe this, you know, set of activities and it, that very limited vocabulary also showcases just how much we have to learn about how we can talk about ourselves in a way that feels good. Mm -hmm. um, but you can be grateful, thankful, honored, happy, and also be proud of the work you've done. Right. Uh, and I talk about the elements of a strong brag, which are pride, gratitude, uh, showmanship, and presentation. And that gratitude piece, like, it, it's a great thing to espouse in general and feels good and, you know, all the science around how it makes you feel good and other people feel good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, when, uh, you know, posting, you know, our exchange, for example, I'm, I'm grateful that you included me and that's not a false feeling or pretense or anything. Um, and, and that plays a huge part in, in helping people feel close to you when you share your work. That makes sense. And I think the other piece there is, you know, you see a lot of people out there saying, um, you know, humble brag alert, or here, here comes my, you know, self-promotion, you know, kind of thing. You frown upon that, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, it's really hard and really scary to talk about yourself. Uh, it's an act of vul vulnerability. It's right. yourself out there. And that inherently is scary. Mm -hmm. uh, if it were easy, everyone would do it. It's really easy to take shots at someone who's decided to put themselves out there. And people might have things to say. Usually you're just more afraid of what people have to say than what they ever end up saying. But, right. you know, also the internet can be a garbage fire. Um, <laughs> so, but, but those negative qualifiers, hate to brag, but self-promotional or shameless plug. Right. Those are showcasing your discomfort and those translate to your audience or your reader. So I use an example of someone who I'm close to who does a lot of wonderful TV hits. She's super talented, she's super successful, but every single time she posts one, you know, she puts like, you know, shameless self-promotion alert. And right. and self-promotion is hard. I'm giving I you know, I wrote this book because it's hard, because it's scary. It, it elicits the exact same feelings. But then as the reader, I don't know what to do with it because she posts this video and I'm like, well, do I share it? And then it makes your audience shut down. So I don't do anything. With it. Whereas had she said, you know, excited to share this, even if you're faking it till you make it, which sometimes we all are, um, you know, and I look at her do a great job on TV and I think, oh, you know, my friend is hosting this event and needs a moderator, you know, that would be a great thing for you. And she does that and then gets, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Visibility is about, you know, rolling a snowball, uh, you know, and, and momentum versus sort of like sticking a hairdryer on it and, and melting it immediately. So if you can't, you know, at least talk positively about your work, right. I, I, you know, hesitate in saying like, if you can't be proud of it, it's hard, that's hard to do. And that takes work and time, but mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard for anyone else to champion you as well. Right. So don't put that in front of your set when you're sharing things socially, because it'll basically exit out people aren't going to want to attract it's not going to attract more, yeah, it more. Ends up, it, you may as well not share it at all it ends up just <laughs> actually having a negative effect on your reader because he or she doesn't know what to do with it and then right. shut it down and then can't right. celebrate it so there's honestly no point right no that makes sense all right so let's talk about some things that um maybe when's the, the right time to not brag so some of this is trial and error Right. Um, you know, a lot of people come to me and my individual clients, a fine point that I'm mm -hmm. representing or training. It's the same fears. What if people think I'm obnoxious? What if people mm -hmm. think I'm that guy, that girl? Um, and what stops, I, it's almost physically impossible for you to brag too much if you're worried about those things, because 
the people that do, mm -hmm. um, you know, may, you know, maybe a, you know, a blowhard type person does not have that level of self-awareness. And that, mm -hmm. that I think, you know, it's, it's akin to imposter syndrome. You know, mm -hmm. I think the people that are good, only, only people that are good at their jobs worry whether or not they're good at their jobs. Um, but you know, that level of self-awareness is a great tool that you just have to rely on, you know, and, and feel intuitively that you will handle. However, sometimes you put your foot in your mouth, I've done it. I, and sometimes it's just not appropriate and you have to walk it back. Right. Um, also depending on, you know, this is something that makes people uncomfortable and it's hard and it's scary and tempering that if those people are some of the gatekeepers to advancing your career, as much as I want you to tout your accomplishments, if they're going to be too uncomfortable to deal with it, mm -hmm. then that's something to think about too. But some of it's just going to be trial and error right. um, and, and a case of reading the proverbial room since we're all, you know, in online rooms. Right. Now we're in the online room. And that's a great kind of transition to the next point, you know, making a first impression or ongoing good impression in the real world when we were together meeting is, you know, eye contact, handshakes, things of that nature, you know, that's obviously great advice. What advice do you have, I guess, if we go back to that, but then also now that we're in this like virtual all the time Zoom world, what other, how's that changed? You yeah, know, COVID? a bunch of Sims. So, um, yeah, so it's really hard and publishing this book in a pandemic, which is a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have a whole section on handshakes in the book. And, and as soon as I, you know, it was too late and I didn't, right. didn't know what was happening. So right. I wrote an extra free chapter on how oh, to right. be better from home and online, which is on the Brag Better website at brag-better.com, which is right. going to be, I think, expanded upon. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. Uh, yeah. There are some advantages in, in, in this, some small silver linings. It's very scary, hard, difficult time. Mm -hmm. But you are at home. If you are someone who gets more nervous meeting new people, you're able to practice more. You're able to keep notes, you know, up on your computer potentially mm -hmm. where other people can't see them um, and, and sort of playing to your strengths there. But yeah, the, you know, the, the fourth pillar that I added of bragging better is explicit. People don't have time to infer. Nobody can infer things right now. First right. of all, there's no body language. You'd be careful with humor. It it's very, very obviously literally two dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you have to be careful, but you have to be very explicit because um, you know, there is no subtlety right now. Right. So maybe give an example of what you mean by that. So if yeah. So, so if you are wanting to communicate your wins to your boss, you can't drop by your boss's office and like knock on the you know door and be like, Hey, do you have 10 minutes? I just want to talk yeah. to you. Right. Know, I thought I did th that presentation went really well. Can I get some feedback? Mm -hmm. um, saying something like, Hey, you know, I want to be sure I'm communicating my wins to you because we're not in the office and you can't see what I'm doing. You know, right. what's the best way for me to do that? Is that a call? Is that uh, a weekly rundown is that um, a different format that works for you because also they're sort of you want to brag to people how they want to be bragged too. if your boss loves reports and you decide to get on a call and tell him or her your wins that's not gonna register as well right um so so thinking about those things and again you know this idea of a personal website laying out for people laying it just laying it all out there for people online because it's the only option we have right now no, that makes sense Great, great tips and advice. All right, so let's switch gears uh, slightly. We're gonna, we've got a startup audience, a bunch of entrepreneurs out there watching. Can you share? They're gonna, you know, be pitching here shortly. Uh, we've got our top 100 uh, companies at Start the Year Summit here. Can you share some of the um, some pitching tips for anyone that's listening? Yes. Uh, so pitching is hard. Pitching requires a lot of just throwing stuff against the wall. Um, but I would say the best pitches, whether, you know, in this case for funding, um, or for prizes or for attention is considering your audience. Mm -hmm. Um, and are you, you know, getting the information at as, as cohesively and strategically out there as possible? Um, and what does this person want to hear and how are you going to make it clear to them sort of reverse engineering it, if you will, well, I think about, I pitch, my business and my writing and my work all the time. And, and it looks very different. So in this case, I'm talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and I would tell you about, you know, my company and the other entrepreneurs that I've coached or counseled um, and, and, and whatnot versus if I'm talking to 
uh, a different type of potential client in that's a leader in the, you know, legal world and say, okay, here's what I've done with lawyers. I understand the ins and outs of what you can and cannot say um, and the sort of tightrope that you're walking there. But when it comes to pitching, it has to be relevant to whomever you are pitching. Um, don't forget to, and Fran Hauser, who's, who's an investor, who's also in the book mm-hmm. and, and in, the, in the realm of brag better, I only represent people. Don't forget that you are part of the product too. Um, and she talks about how she sees great pitches, but these founders, particularly women, but not only women, leave out why they're so wonderful. Um, and so don't leave that out too, because also people, you're investing in an idea, but you're investing in a person. And so much of my work comes from what I saw as a millennial entrepreneur and this extreme cult of personality and how, you know, leadership is a driver of business for good or bad more than ever before, um, which we've had in American history, but it's so much more extreme now that don't leave yourself out of it. Um, and, and there are lots of different kinds of leaders in the way that you want to be visible, but that's a huge part of it now for investors as well is, you know, what, what are you going to do as a leader, as a founder, as a COO um, to help, you know, get the company visibility and propel it forward. That makes sense. All right. Um, Now, part of that too, is, you know, you've done a lot of speaking in your, in your career. Um, Some of the founders here and and other entrepreneurs and and corporate folks that are here, investors, um, they all probably have had speaking gigs, but can you, you know, how do you feel about that as a way to get out there and, and brag better? I mean, it's great. It's really saturated right now. Um, I love doing speaking. Uh, I, you know, I miss being on stages and I miss having stage fright, which is really weird because, you know, I do it anyway and speak constantly. Um, right. It's a great way to get out there. I mean, it's the ultimate form of authority. Susan Cain, who I interviewed for the book, who wrote Quiet is the reason why we talk about introversion. Um, and she talked about how like she could write an article and people would think she was an authority, but she's on a stage for five minutes and people are like, oh, you are now that, you know, it's something in, in humans brains. Like it's one reason. And she also talked about her dream stage fright, mm-hmm. um, not stage fright, you know, fear of public speaking, which is incredibly universal and normal, right. um, is it's just also an inherently unnatural human activity. If you were standing in front of a group of people alone outside of the pack, usually meant they were going to attack you. Um, <laughs> but but it's a wonderful thing if you can get involved in speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though it is saturated, it's never been easier to be on a virtual panel mm-hmm. um, and to organize a virtual panel and to be a part of speaking things because now there's no travel schedules. There's no, you know, crisscrossing around around the country or around the world. Um, so it's a great way to to build up your authority for sure. So if you were out there trying to do that, how would you get more speaking gigs right now? Just any tips or tricks for anybody that's, you know, got a company or wants to try to get it in front of people? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm undercutting my own business, you know, and all the rest of us that get paid to speak, but, Mm -hmm. you know, first of all, nobody knows that you're available to speak unless you tell them. And a lot of my clients want to be speaking. And I say, okay, that's fine. But nowhere does it say that you are, you have spoken, you're available to speak. Someone can book you to speak. Uh, there are no photos of you on a stage holding a microphone. Uh, people, you don't speak. Oh. I mean, people think you don't speak, right? Like that's, so, that's, the- well, and that's, that's so much of it. Nobody knows what you've done and nobody right. knows what you want until you tell them to ask them. And that's right. very true with speaking. Like they're like, oh, I want to speak more. I'm like, well, that's fine. But nowhere on your personal website or nowhere in your bio is there a nod to one speech? Right. Uh, like, well, oh, I've only given a couple speeches. And I'm like, but yes, brag better. You've literally given them. Bragging is stating facts. You've done it. So state it. Um, right. But also the order in which you state things really matters. Uh, because as humans, we absorb what you tell us first. So mm-hmm. even if you are an entrepreneur and a writer, let's say, but you really want to be speaking more and you say that you are an entrepreneur, writer, and speaker, people will think entrepreneur, you know, you're telling people what you care about, right. uh, but in the order in which you say it. So if you switch it around and say, oh, I'm a speaker, writer, and entrepreneur, then they're like, oh, a speak, you know, so, so you have to show up for yourself in that way and mm-hmm. post those photos if you have them, post the video if you have them. Um, you know, video really, really matters. Conference bookers want to know what you look like, what you sound like, what your setup looks like. Right. Um, you know, do you have a ring light now is a thing, you know, I mean, so uh, you just have to say you're available to talk and you have to ask all the time. And, you know, even if 
sometimes you see someone you know who is on a panel and you get jealous, but a better response is to reach out to that person and say, hey, like if there's ever a speaking gig that you're unable to do or is not, you know, on your pay structure, like it's not your fees, you know, I'd be so grateful for you to pass it to me. I always want to pass great speaking gigs to people. That's, you know, highlight something that we got too long to the conversation for me to say, which is that bragging better is a team sport and it's part mm -hmm. of your job to pass the mic and share the mic and, you know, lift up other voices. And, and if you're someone we listen to and in a position of privilege, it is part of your job to do so. Yep. A lot of these conference brokers aren't, won't do the work. So, you know, if you know someone, a woman, a person of color, mm -hmm. um, who would, you know, make a really great speaker, suggest them and uh, champion them too. It's free. For you. Yep. That, that was going to be my, my next question is what can I do as a white man to help, you know, other women and minorities. So basically go out there, champion what they're doing, share what they're doing on social media and other things. But also every time you get asked to speak, is there gender equity on the panel? You right. know, or is it diverse? If not, right. make some suggestions. It's free. You know, a lot of people be, yep. you know, be committed to, you know, say, I really want to do this panel, but I noticed that there are no black people on it. And, you know, I want to make sure that, you're being inclusive and, or again, there you get asked, I'm sure to do a lot of stuff. If you can't do it, make a concerted effort that yep. you suggest a list of people um, who aren't white dudes. And that is a great service. Right. And we, we take that very seriously, uh, you know, with all of our events, we've done hundreds of events throughout the last decade and it's something we pay close attention to. So I'm glad that you're putting it out there and helping other people realize that that's something that needs to be done as well. And it's so never, case of, you know, people ask me, so the qualified quiet is irrespective of gender. A lot of my work is around women and bragging, but a lot of people are like, oh, do you want men to shut up? You know, and it's no, you yeah. are the default voices we listen to. We need you to help champion us. It only makes you look better and it's free for you to do. So there's really no excuse. And it's good to just keep it top of mind. It's a tremendous service and an important one. Um, and it doesn't minimize your accomplishments or take away the opportunities that will come to you either. Uh, there is room on the stage, literal or figurative for everyone. Right. And I think you're hundred percent right. I loved your book. It's a great roadmap for anyone looking out, out there to raise their profile. You've got your copy. I'll keep mine here. And uh, Meredith, wh where can people find you if they want to uh, yes, connect? So you? Please consider buying Brag Better or requesting it from your local library. Uh, go to brag-better.com. It has a list of independent bookstores, independent black owned bookstores you can order from or, you know, the big guy. Uh, I did the audio book. I recorded it in a closet in quarantine. You can listen to me talk it at you for seven hours, uh, mm -hmm. get on your Kindle, et cetera. I'm MeredithFeynman.com, at MeredithFeynman, mostly on Instagram is my favorite platform. Thanks so much, Meredith. That was pretty amazing. And I hope that the conversation helps startups that are out there trying to talk about themselves better, pitch their ideas, and try to get people to believe in them. Uh, because they know that's a hard thing to do. And uh, obviously, you shared some great nuggets there, and I hope people uh, were able to learn something from your from our conversation, and thanks again for joining. All right, well, that's the episode. We hope you enjoyed it and were able to you know, find something new and interesting from this conversation. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you're thinking about something differently. That's what we're all about here. Thanks again for listening. Please subscribe to the show and review it if you can. We'd really appreciate it. And remember, if you have a startup idea and you want to get it going, today is the best day to start up. Don't wait. Just get it going, iterate, and get it out there. Until next time, I'm Frank Gruber signing off. Stay safe and be well out there. Thanks for listening to the Startup of the Year podcast. Be sure to subscribe and we'll be back with another episode soon.